Good afternoon. Welcome to the Covestro Arena at K2022. How are you guys? Doing good? All right. So everyone knows Google, right? Yes, of course we do. We know it as a brand. We know the hardware, the software. Yet not many people actually know how much Google does in the field of research. They spend a huge amount of money on research for the various sciences, different applications. And they're also one of the big players in the field of quantum computing. So now, of course, we want to connect quantum computing to the chemical and the plastics industry with Covestro to find out why are they collaborating with, with Google and how can it help them advance their circular strategy. So let's bring out the two guys involved in this. First, we have Tom O'Brien. He's a research scientist for Google Research. And please give him a big round of applause. Yes. Hello, Tom. And then we also have Christian Gogolin. He is with Digital R&D for Covestro. So guys, um, before we let Tom explain what Google is doing in the realm of quantum computing, Christian, tell us a little bit about this connection to Covestro. Why is Covestro in it and you know, what are you doing there? Yeah, so quantum computing is this emerging technology that uh, promises uh, us the ability to do much more accurate simulations of chemistry than we can do today. And uh, yeah, together with Google, we had the pleasure to explore the nitty gritty details of this uh, technology over the past two years. And we very recently put a paper out that uh, breaks some records in terms of size and complexity of the largest quantum computings, computations for chemistry that have been done. And uh, yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have Tom here today. All right. Yeah, I, I can imagine there are a lot of nitty gritty details in there. And we do have some time for questions afterwards. So, you know, prepare your questions now. Also, if you're watching us uh, through a digital channel, you know, keep your questions coming like before. And Tom or Christian will be more than happy to answer them. All right, Tom. So we'll give you the stage now. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in a few minutes. All right. All right. If I click here, then this should come up. Fantastic. OK, so 280 years ago, uh, Lavoisier was born, and this is as good a point as any to split chemistry away from alchemy and say that this is where modern chemistry was started. 95 years ago, Heidler and London did the first simulations of quantum chemistry and started doing chemistry by numbers instead of chemistry by chemicals. This has some advantages. You know, numbers are less prone to spilling. You don't need fume hoods, and they go bang less often, which is important in the lab. And then about 40 years ago, some guy called Feynman uh, came up with the idea, pointed out that numbers, sorry, chemistry, the problem of chemistry is it's inherently a quantum problem. And this means that we should probably make those numbers quantum if we want to get the advantage in, in solving uh, you know, any, any kind of problem in, in chemistry or physics. This started a stream of research, which eventually turned into a river. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to explain how a quantum computer promises to be of use in chemistry tell you a little bit about when and how we expect to achieve these promises, and then point out the milestones along the way and what we promise to do along, what, what you might expect to see from us as we go on this path towards scalable fault-tolerant quantum computing. So uh, I should probably go and introduce the team before I begin. Um, this isn't the entire team. This is just you know, the 2020 portrait of us come from uh, from COVID. We're about, we're, we're well over 100 people now in quantum AI. We sit within Google, um, Google Applied Sciences, which itself sits within Google Research. Um, there's a huge disparate background, set of backgrounds here from hardware engineers to software engineers to fabrication, people who do 
to um, build and design the devices, to people like myself who figure out what we might eventually run on it. But we all have you know, something in common, which is a love of basic research, because quantum computing is still basic research. And I'm not trying to, I'm not here with a, a new product that you can expect to see on you know, ads or cloud or, or search in the, next, in the next year or so. OK, let me tell you a bit about how we can simulate a molecule on a quantum computer. And to do that, I want to take everyone's favorite molecule, which is the, the dihydrogen uh, molecule. It's the simplest thing you can come up with and still call it a molecule. And when we talk about simulating something on a quantum computer, we talk about simulating the electron cloud that surrounds two fixed nuclei coordinates. Okay? Now, the way to represent this on a quantum computer is actually really simple. After you've done a lot of you know, classical computation overhead, you know, if I have the electron on the left hand, if I have a single electron on the left hand nuclei, then that I can say is the z one zero. And if, that I, if I have a single electron on the right hand nuclei, I can call that thing zero one. Okay? So this is two quantum bits to represent this, or qubits as we call them for short. And then I want to you know, put, these two put these two atoms together to form a molecule. You form the, the two atomic orbitals form what you call a chemical bond up the top. right? And, a, and an, what the, the, it is also possible to form an antibonding pair, which is down the bottom. And in this case, these uh, atoms are actually fly apart, and you won't have your chemical bond. And this has a really natural representation on the quantum device, because that thing up there is the sum of the two starting states. And the thing down here is the difference, the two starting states. And I'm writing sum and, sum and difference to emphasize, you know, that it's not emphasis, it's, it's the way that we represent it. This is something you can only do on a quantum device, right? Because if I have a classical computer, I have either, you know, zero, one or one, zero, or you could do something probabilistic and get a combination of the two, but that only actually gets you the plus. Whereas on a quantum computer, we do have this magical minus sign that appears, and this allows us to, to properly represent the dynamics of two hydrogen molecules coming together to form a molecule using only two bits. Now, this is really simple. I mean, hydrogen you can do on a pen and paper. You don't need a quantum computer to, to track all of the, the minus signs when there's only one. But real wave functions have many signs to track. Okay? And when I say many here, I actually mean exponentially many. Okay? And this is exactly the problem that you get when you try to simulate like this nitrogenase molecule over here on a classical computer. And this is exactly the problem that we think that we could solve or that we think that we could attack with a quantum device. And so having this natural representation allows us to hit all of chemistry, you know, catalysts, semiconductors, superconductors, protein drugs, polymers especially for, for, this, for this audience, and OLEDs, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Anytime you have a hard electronic structure problem, we have a chance of solving on a quantum computer. All right, let me switch really quickly to telling you where we are now. Right? So today we're in. Today, the reason why you haven't seen a, a quantum computer solve big problems in chemistry, and the reason why I'm not saying we're not promising anything right now is noise. Okay? Here is our, this is a paper that I think came out around about the same time, like last K20, like last K conference, which is our, a very um, famous paper that came out in 2019, uh, where we demonstrated the first, what we call, beyond classical algorithm, right? It's a quantum algorithm that at the time we couldn't simulate on the world's largest supercomputer. Uh, it took 53 qubits, and the gate, the, the gate error rate was somewhere between 0.1% and 1% per operation. This means if you perform about 1,000 operations, or somewhere between 100 and 1,000, everything dies off, you lose your computation, you get nothing. Okay? Now, to put things in perspective, the computations that I, wanted to do, that I talked about on the last slide, they require millions, if not billions, of operations. So there's a bit of a disconnect here. The way we get around that disconnect is by quantum error correction which is a way of, you know, it's, it's effectively the quantum version of, of the checksums that you get on, say, your, your credit card that prevent you making, like, you know, single errors. We can scale this up. We have a, you know, a beautiful theory of, of uh, fault-tolerant quantum error correction that promises that we can get a path to advantage, but it requires something on the order of a, a million qubits, whereas the number of qubits we had in 2019 was 53. Okay. In, the, in the meantime, and I know there's an error on here, we're in what's called, it's been coined as the NISC era by John Preskill. And NISC stands for noisy, not near term, intermediate scale quantum error. See, this is a classical error you see right there. Uh, and so in this point, we don't have any promises that we can succeed yet. And what we're looking for is low hanging applications with short circuits that satisfy this you know, thousand gate budget. A lot of classical coprocessing to take over the top of it, and a lot of error mitigation. And this is work that we've, we've been um, pursuing for the last, uh, you know, since 2019, including with our industrial partnership program with Covestro as one of our, our key partners. 
Okay. And where will this get, and, and where, how, how do we go from here to there? Okay. So we published our, oh, this has got a, a thing on the end. We published our um, error correction uh, roadmap. I think this, was, this came out last year, right, which pushed uh, six milestones from the 2019 paper, which is uh, beyond classical, um, all the way up to a million, a million qubit fault tolerant computer. And kind of every step, we're growing by a factor of 10. We're 10xing it every, every, single, every single step. And the idea is that once we go from, you know, once we go from to a logical qubit prototype and then one logical qubit and then to a tileable module at about the, between 10 to 4 to 10 to the 5, this is the point where all of the physics, you know, the fundamental questions that we're still not sure about, these questions are hopefully answered at that point. And we think that after we get to 10 to the 4, it's inevitable and it's just an engineering challenge. I mean, surely people here know that engineering challenges are still challenges, but we get a lot more confident the further we get along this roadmap. And the marker showing where we, where we are, this is our, our paper, this is our um, error correction paper on suppressing, suppressing physical error by encoding in, a, in, a, um, in what's known as a surface code. And this was released last month. There's a link down there. So here's this, here's this paper. I'll just go briefly into what it is. The idea here is that you encode one logical qubit of data across 25 physical qubits, right? You can see the grid of 25 uh, five by five yellow data qubits. And you have 24 parity checks, right? Because 25 minus 24 is one. And with those 24 parity checks, you use them to diagnose the errors that occur as you try to hold this information for as long as possible. And then from there, you can try to suppress noise. And the take home from this paper is that the blue curve sits under the red curve, right? That's an easy way of saying it. The red, what the red curve is, is in, instead of encoding this data in 25 qubits, which is 5 by 5, I could have encoded it in 9 qubits, which is a 3 by 3 square. And the idea about error correction is that by going from smaller to bigger, I can suppress the error exponentially, right? We only see one point of data here, so we don't know, you know, showing it's an exponential curve is kind of hard, but this is showing suppression of of, uh, of physical error. So this is a big milestone for us, and we're really happy to, um, you know, to, to finally have this thing finished. All right. Let me get on to, to, let me now go back to chemistry and talk a little bit about what problems we hope we can tackle. Now, something I want to emphasize here, and this is maybe a, mis a misconception that's in the community, is that quantum computers are inherently fast. Quantum computers are not fast. If you saw, like, we went up to from 1 to 25 cycles on the graph on the previous slide. Each one of those cycles takes a microsecond. In order to do a logical operation, you need a few hundred or so of those cycles. And this means that my, once we get a fault-tolerant error, once we get a fault-tolerant quantum computer, the clock speed of that computer, like the first generations of this, is going to be about a kilohertz. And I get kind of, you know, the, you might have seen the scale diagram two slides back. This is going to be a room-sized quantum computer. And so I get one of these, and it's going to compete against, you know, like, say, a million CPUs operating at one gigahertz. Now, the lovely thing about exponential speedups is there are still problems where one little quantum computer that's incredibly slow can beat a, billion, you know, a million classical computers or even a billion classical computers that are quite fast. But they're not, that, they're, they're, they're not always around. You really need the exponential speed up to get this. And moreover, you need approximate classical algorithms to fail. And we're fighting you know, 100 years and a much larger group of people who've been developing approximate classical algorithms because they exist to solve the problems that everyone's facing. So our competition here is really, is really, um, is really fierce. In the chemistry world, there are kind of two types of, of problems that we expect to solve. Right? The first one is just generally problems with strong correlations. Right? Metal clusters, periodic systems, transition states, or problems beyond the ground state, because a lot of, although a lot of, a lot of chemistry is ground state problems, and a lot of method development has gone towards trying to solve ground state problems in chemistry. So things like spectroscopy, electron transport, combustion, vibronics, all of these excited state problems get a lot harder for, for classical methods, which means we have an easier path to an advantage. Uh, I'll put up here, this is the poster child for quantum computing and quantum chemistry. It's the nitrogenase molecule. It's like the biological version of the Haber-Bosch process. Um, and I do want to point out that since, this, since this, this molecule was proposed in 2013, and the original gate count for this, this molecule, T gates, is like kind of the thing that you want to count if you want to see what the, the cost of doing the simulation was, started off at around 10 to the 20. And in the last decade, this has been brought down by 11 orders of magnitude all the way from 10 to the 9. So we are making progress here, and we are trying to, you know, this, this factor of a million qubits is really, you know, this is after a lot of work, and we're hoping we can push it down further. Um, 
and so I should say, chemistry is not the only problem that we know in quantum computing. It is kind of the killer app, the application, because it's the thing that, you know, that people are very interested in, and in, especially in industry. But we do have a whole spectrum of things we think we can solve. At about 25 to 50K qubits, we can start doing stuff in like uh, quantum chaos and, and, and scrambling and black holes. We had a recent paper, or Maria Sparopoulou from Caltech had a recent paper using our device where they simulated a black hole on our device. Great work, you should check it out. Um, at about the 50K to 250K, we can start doing spin simulations or like simulations of toy lattice models. Uh, up there is a Hubbard model, of, which is like the prototypical model for superconductivity below an NMR spectrometer. And then around you know, the 250K to 1 million qubit mark, we can start doing chemistry just kind of on a coarse grain level that maybe isn't sufficient for proper application. Once we get to a million qubits, then we hope we can you know, really, really start tackling chemistry. In the meantime, Oh, uh, so yeah, chemistry is what we're interested in. But in the meantime, we're hoping that some of the, num the numbers I'm stating here are like for fault-tolerant quantum algorithms. But we're hoping maybe we can, with clever error mitigation and you know variational quantum algorithms, or you know the near-term applications, we can possibly find some of these to fit on the device before going to, you know, before going to like 10k qubits or so. And so, okay, yeah, what what do we do in NISC, right? So now let's go back to to what we're doing, what we're playing around with now, and to emphasize, you know, this is research that's been, that we just, that Christian mentioned, that we've just put on the archive, uh, collaboration between Google and Covestro. So, the thing that people, that's the most popular to do in NISC is the variational, is the variational quantum eigensolver. The way you do this is you generate a, you create a quantum circuit, right? And this quantum circuit is, has some free parameters, and then you just optimize those free parameters so that the state this circuit produces is as close to the ground state of your device as possible. Okay, you then and, and this this works well, right? Uh, you can see here on the left. This is our simulation of um, of diazine you, in, within Hartree-Fock theory. You can see we get quite good accuracy to the, the the real curve, which you can of course calculate on a classical computer because it's only a 10 qubit simulation. On the right hand side, this is a simulation with Cavestro of a small superconducting grain, and again you can see that we're doing a lot better than even some of the classical approximate theories, and we're really kind of you know, getting qualitative features of this curve correct, which we're very, we're really excited we managed to get that out in the end. Um, however, you know, the, the thing that we asked in this, in this paper as well is we were thinking about, you know, how do we actually scale these variational methods to, to, to larger systems? And here we think it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Okay, so the first thing to note is that none of the simulations that people have done, so the, the, the list I'm giving here is like kind of labeled as the state of the art of like quantum chemistry simulations of like what people have done as we go from 2014 all the way up to our recent work in 2022. And although these, you know, we're slowly growing in number, but actually none of these simulations have managed to reach kind of the gold standard of accuracy in quantum chemistry, which is chemical, ac you know, chemical accuracy, 1.6 milli Hartree. Um, and so we're not sure, you know, we, we still need to work harder to try to get there. And it's unclear whether or not we can do it with the, the error rates that we will get on this roadmap towards fault tolerance. Furthermore, uh, thanks, to, thanks to Christian's group, we've had uh, a, lot of, a large amount of simulation work in how long, uh, you know, what would be the cost in terms of real, you know, real runtime to execute these circuits and actually get enough data to make these, uh, make these um, simulations as we push from 10 to 50 qubits. And we expect that we'd need about a thousand fold reduction, uh, sorry, thousand fold increase in the, in like the wall clock time, which is um, quite significant. And yeah, 25 times error reduction, which is also quite significant for experimentalists to handle. I will say that this doesn't mean that NISC is completely dead. But it does mean that we think we need more use case stories. And this is where I'd reach out to the audience to say, you know, we want the cheapest problems for a quantum device. We want the problems that people have been surprised at how hard, they have, uh, how hard they've been to solve, given how small they are. Because these are the ones where we expect to be able to beat the classical competition at the earliest stage possible. You know, we really need the low hanging fruit. And we think that industry is a great place to find more, more fruit to, um, to, to grab. Uh, let me go, let me finish up then with uh, four possible applications of a quantum computer beyond, um, beyond the, the variational paradigm. And what you can hope to see with us both now and, and in the future um, 
in the future, in the, in the years to come. So the first thing I want to focus on is, the, is, is this is work from our, our team along with uh, collaborators in Colombia. We're looking at quantum classical hybrid quantum Monte Carlo. And so this is again doing chemistry, but the idea is that we can, instead of trying to generate exact states on the quantum computer, we can try to generate approximate states that we feed into a quantum Monte Carlo routine to beat the fermion sign problem. And this has yielded some really good accuracy, some incredibly good accuracies at mid-range problems on the order of like 15 qubits um, already. And this is the first time this was tried. Another thing to um, identify, this is uh, work for our team it's in, in PRX Quantum, um, is instead of trying to solve the problem of electronic structure, try to look at spin structure, solving the nuclear spin Hamiltonian to improve on NMR, on NMR um, experiments, and in particular to be able to push ourselves to NMR experiments where the data is hard to interpret. NMR is a fantastic spectroscopic technique because usually the data is easy to interpret, but for that to be the case, you need to have you know these incredibly large NMR spectrometers. If you go down to low fields, your dipolar coupling will typically kill your experiment and make it you know, impossible to interpret. This is where we think a quantum computer may come in. Another thing that a, where a, a quantum computer might come in is you, can in is you can have quantum enhanced experiments. If I had a way of loading up multiple copies of a quantum state onto my device from a quantum, from a quantum sensor, then we can prove, then you can prove like an exponential advantage in processing those, um, those, um, uh, those copies to generate, uh, uh, to generate you know, measurements or, or to um, answer questions about the state. Um, and then finally, a final, final question that we're trying to um, trying to answer. So up here on the right, I'm actually showing this is the this is like the uh, fault tolerant model, or I guess you call it like the fault tolerant logical equivalent of a single logical gate. Right? It's a very big um, it's a very big diagram, and kind of each of the in, in x and y, this is actually the qubits, and in the z space is the time direction. So every single one of these gates is incredibly costly to implement, which is what led to this one kilohertz quantum QPU clock cycle that I mentioned earlier. And so one of the questions we're trying to answer is to say, why not all gates are like this? What if we can gain some of the protection for some of our gates and performed these incredibly expensive gates using you know, non-fault tolerant methods and try to link the two and meet in the middle? Another thing that we're trying to do is to use um, reset and measurement, which is not common in this circuits up till now, to realize a dissipative map. So like this is a, 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 a non-unitary, a non-quantum non map. It has an interesting and, non, and, and difficult to si classically simulate fixed point. Um, yeah, and, fi and, and if that was the case, then the errors might not, uh, we, we might not need to have our error map, uh, sorry, our error budget completely used up by the time we've gotten to the end of the circuit, but just by the time we've gotten to one of the small parts. With that, I'll finish up. Oh, well, I don't know if it's going to work. So quantum computers can speed up chemistry because you can treat a quantum computer exactly as an artificial molecule. We have a 10-year path towards a fault-tolerant quantum computer. However, near-term applications in paradigm need a, sorry, near-term applications in, in chemistry need a paradigm shift. And to all of our friends in industry and academia, we appreciate as many use case stories as you can find for uh, quantum computers now and in the future. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. All right, um, thank you very much, Christian. Come join us. So, really fascinating, um, especially when we look to the future, how near or long term that is. So, Christian, let me ask you, you know, what's in it for Covestro at the moment? Because we're simply not there yet. You know, as we just heard, uh, so long term, yes, as, as soon as we get the number of qubits, you know, and we make it uh, fault tolerant, et cetera. But you're in this now, um, do you have concrete benefits or is that also just research motivation for you? Yeah, so I, I think the first benefit is really to get an um, as good understanding of the progress of this technology as possible because um, well, we've seen these uh, sort of, that you can reach these crossover points where, where the exponential scaling suddenly sort of kicks in and once mm -hmm. you're past this crossover point then the technology, so, so getting there is sort of very painful and takes a long time and is very difficult. But once you pass this crossover point, then quantum computing starts to work really well. Um, and so we really want to know uh, how far we are from this crossover point to be then among the first to be able to profit from this new technology. And then, uh, yeah, on the side, I think I can say that we are also learning a lot about classical computational method development mm -hmm. uh, along the way that is uh, yeah, already profiting the, the quantum chemists and digital R&D today. 
Uh, yeah, like Tom said, it needs a paradigm shift. So, you know, looking at things differently. All right, so at this point, I want to open it up to the audience and ask you if you have any questions uh, either for Tom or for Christian. And also, if you watching us online have any questions, put them in now. This is the time, the unique situation that we have our researcher here on. Yes, on the stage, Hi. please. Uh, this is Chris. Thanks for this uh, nice talk and introduction. And it also helped me to, to understand this misconception of quantum computing that you explained. Um, what I missed a little bit, and I was wondering if you could explain that <laughs> a little bit, is how does it actually work in terms of how do you physically implement a qubit? What is your device? Like, how does it look like? Do you have a picture? How can I imagine that? Oh, if I can, uh, so I can't go all the way back to the, the picture. The picture on the very front slide is, is a picture of our device. Or really, it's a picture of the dilution refrigerator that it sits inside. So there are many different technologies for quantum computation. At Google, we work with superconducting qubits. Now, the way you can think of a superconducting qubit is it's, well, you, you get a, you know, a, 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 like a. Tom, there it is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's our, there's our, so the there, there's the fridge, and the device would sit in the very center. Okay, but what it is, it's like a computer chip, right? But instead of a, com you know, normal computer chip, you fabricate like lith you lithograph like semiconductor on top of a substrate. We lithograph superconductor on top of a substrate, and by lithograph, I just mean you know we draw lines, right? And then if you draw like you know if you put two pieces of superconductor right next to each other, they act as a capacitor. And if I connect them through a thin gap, this is actually what it is a quant is as a Josephs injunction. And now a Josephs injunction is kind of like it's it's to a capacitor as position is to momentum. Okay? And so then our cube, and in particular, Josephs injunction has a superconducting loop. And in particular, our qubit states, right? So if you want to describe, if you want to talk about you know, a zero or one on your hard drive back in the days of magnetic hard drives, you know, a bit old. Uh, then you know a zero is like all of these spins pointing down, all, all of these, and one is all of these spins pointing up. On a super, and superconducting hardware, zero is roughly all of the electrons moving to the left around the loop, and a one is all of the electrons moving to the right around the loop. Okay? And then you can, you know, we, we put this, we then cool this to 20 millikelvin, which is what this is all for. It's a, it's a dilution refrigerator. And if you put a very thin microwave cavity right next to your qubit, and you have this at the right frequency, then you can, you know, you can put in microwaves, and they will excite and de-excite your, your device. So you can go from 0 to 1 and vice versa. You can measure which state you're in. And if you couple these, if you then get another microwave cavity and couple it to couple two of these qubits, then they'll interact in the way that, that spins do. So you have to program your microwave to, to do the computation. Yes, everything. So you know, when when I when I'm a I'm a theorist. When I write something, I, I draw stuff out in the circuit model, which is like you know, a, cla a quantum version of logic gates, and then this gets turned into microwave signals. Each one of these gates is a signal to the, you know either to the drive line or to some coupling line or something, and then these get and then this will this will go into like so you know a mixture of like a a microwave generator and then some modulation on top of it to pass the right signal all the way from room temperature down to 20 millikelvin, and then it interacts with the device. And then you'll send down a different signal, which you'll demodulate, you know, which will measure the qubits. This signal comes back up, you put it into a lock-in amplifier, and you demodulate it, and you can learn, you know, you can make measurements and extract information that way. But it's all, all microwave generation, all, all microwave processing. And just so you know for the audience, in that there will be a test on quantum computing after this talk. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so do we have any more questions from the audience? All right, then let me ask you, oh, yeah, <laughs> another one. Go for so, it. Uh, the error correction you talked about, is that, can I imagine that as a classical error correction, or is this also based on quantum computations? It's surprisingly similar to classical error correction, but then you have kind of two or three caveats. The first caveat is I'm not actually allowed to look at my information, right? Because if I look at my information, I destroy it. That's one of the weird things about quantum computing. Physics. Yeah, exactly. That's physics. So instead, what you have to do is you have to divide, design your measurement scheme so that you, you, know, you look at the checksum, right? the quantum checksum, but you don't perturb the system in any other way. And so we achieved this by use of, if you, if you remember the slide I had previously, which kind of showed this 5 by 5 grid of qubits, there were ancilla qubits that were sitting in the middle of every square. And these ancilla qubits do like a parity measurement across the four neighboring qubits. And this is the, the versions of a checksum we have. The second problem you have to deal with is that 
you know, you remember that I, I said that you know a hydrogen atom has like this plus and this minus sign between the two states. Well, if if I'm representing two states by virtue of whether it's a plus sign or a minus sign, then going from plus to minus is an error, right? If that if that happens on the device without me knowing about it, so that's an error, and it's as bad as like going from zero to one. And so you have to design checks that that take care of the plus and minus signs as well as zero one signs. But we have ways of doing this. It's 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 surprisingly similar to classical error correction. It's just you know uh, you've got to do just take a couple of leaps of logic. Um, and then I guess the third problem is just that you know the the, the numbers don't work out so well. The, the cost of doing this is a lot worse than the cost of doing classical error correction. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. So um, last question. We're almost out of time. Uh, Christian, uh, let me ask you. We've heard so much about the technical aspects, but we're here at K2022, and we talk about circularity and enabling a circular economy. Uh, and that happens also with advanced materials when it comes to cholesterol. So how does it help you advance the strategy uh, and the circular economy? W what's in it for you using quantum computing? Yeah, so the way I think about it is that um, uh, this whole push towards circularity, this in general creates a lot of need for R&D, for research and development, for the development of new uh, reaction paths to make our production processes more environmentally friendly or uh, recycling routes. And, and a lot of the, uh, these questions are just hard chemical problems for which uh, yeah, that haven't been solved yet mm -hmm. with the existing tools. So um, we will probably need new tools to, to solve these problems. And uh, yeah, as we've seen before, uh, quantum computing promises us ways to uh, especially attack these like, difficult chemical settings, like uh, when you have certain exotic uh, elements in your catalysts, for example. And uh, this, um, yeah, really, hopefully, will um, uh, one day uh, enable us to find better reaction paths, better recycling routes, uh, and yeah, deliver on this strategy. All right, thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you for coming and joining Thanks, us Thomas. here and sharing all your insights, taking us on this exciting journey uh, about quantum computing. Thank you, Christian, for sharing your experience in this project. And hopefully, you know, maybe the next K we'll talk again and see the advances mm -hmm. and just check how far quantum computing has come today. All right, so this is your applause. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Let's keep talking. All right. All right.